fertility in the soil, different opportunities to um, increase the microbiome, but it all starts in the soil. And so the next two presenters are going to be um, Dr. Wayne Honeycutt and Dr. Mikhail Ranka talking about some of the aspects of soil. And Dr. Wayne Honeycutt is going to talk to us specifically about some of the different advances in, in soil health. I think soil health, from my perspective, is one of those innocuous terms we hear a lot about. And it's bantered about in a big way across the industry, both from a consumer side and the scientist side, and really helping to understand what it is, what that means, will be really important going forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Wayne Honeycutt from the uh, Soil Health Institute to come up here and give some remarks. Please help me welcome Dr. Wayne Honeycutt. Uh, thanks to all the good friends at Agri Authority for the opportunity to come visit with you today. Uh, as Luke mentioned, I'm Wayne Honeycutt, and I have the pleasure of serving as the uh, President and CEO of the Soil Health Institute. We are a nonprofit uh, stationed uh, at a Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, uh, but we currently have projects across North America with aspirations to be global within the next year or so. There are a lot of challenges that are addressing all of those to which we serve, primarily our farmers. Uh, challenges such as needing to feed another 2 billion people just by the year 2050. I should add, not only feed them, but clothe them, right? But we know that we are increasingly challenged to do that, and one of the reasons uh, is because in the last 100 years, we've lost approximately 40 to 60 percent of the basic building block that makes soil productive. And that really provides those nutrients, provides that microenvironment that helps your products your seeds and the products you might be coating those seeds with that uh, be effective. We also know that drought is just increasing like crazy. And extreme weather events uh, in general are, are increasing like crazy. At any given point in time, uh, approximately 1% of the world's arable land is experiencing drought. Our model predictions of greenhouse gases and other variables tell us that by the year 2100, that's going to increase to 30% of the world's arable land. Now think of what that means in so many respects, not just the efficacy of your product, but we need to grow all this food that takes more water, uh, but also there's more and more potential conflicts with things like the Endangered Species Act, you know, providing salmon habitat for the use of that water, what's happening uh, to our aquifers, all, all those types of things. There's just kind of a, a perfect storm uh, that is brewing here. And we have an opportunity now for addressing a lot of it. I think soil health, uh, I think the research shows that soil health is one of those great opportunities for addressing so many of these uh, issues simultaneously in ways that's good for the farmer. We know that increasing greenhouse gas emissions, um, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen maybe about, maybe it's about a month or so ago, that the highest level of greenhouse gas emissions ever recorded uh, has been reported. And you know, you can go use ice ring data, um, uh, or ice core data, I should say, tree ring, coral reef, that type of data, and know that the current greenhouse gas emissions levels are the highest now they've been in the last 10,000 plus years. Water quality, increasingly, uh, farmers are, are being focused on with the source of nutrients, having uh, tremendous water quality issues. And it's not just in the U.S. The, the issues in the U.S. for water quality, like in the Gulf of Mexico, Western Lake Erie Basin, Chesapeake Bay, these places, that's not just confined to North America. You can you, use see eutrophic zones uh, all over the world. And of course, the economics of farming. In, increasingly, farmers are just, you know, uh, have the thinnest, thinnest uh, margins for profit for staying in business, and we need them to, not just for growing our food, but for managing our landscapes in, in a viable way. Now, as I mentioned a while ago, the, the thing about soil health is that this concept really does help us achieve uh, a lot of these issues, address a lot of these challenges, affect and benefit a lot of our natural resource issues in ways that's good for the farmer, good for the environment. Um, just the practice of soil health that's been around for decades, as that plant material decomposes, it goes through a process called humification, where the leaves and stems and stalks actually can no longer be distinguishable. It becomes part of that soil, it becomes part of that humus, that's why we call it humification. 
And we know we can do this. There's a lot of, a lot of peer-reviewed scientific literature uh, that shows we can increase carbon in our soil. Uh, this is just six different studies that I put up just so you can compare carbon in the conventional tillage system <coughs> with carbon in the no tillage system. You can see the results 23 to 26, 60 to 71. And on down through the line. And the reason why that that's just so important is not just because of carbon sequestration, uh, with taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, storing the soil, so reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's extremely important. But it's also really important for the farmers. And a big reason is, is this relationship right here. When you increase organic carbon in your soil, you actually increase the capacity of that soil to hold plant available water. And and so that basically builds drought resilience. Now, I'm always quick to tell farmers and ranchers that this does not make it rain. <laughs> but what it does do is it helps their soil make the most out of what rain that they receive. And it helps them with their irrigation system to be the most efficient, have to use like less energy or run in those systems more often and things like this. Now, there's also plenty of peer-reviewed scientific literature that shows when we increase soil health and use these soil health promoting practices, we can impact infiltration, increase infiltration in the soil, reduce runoff of micronutrients in the, out of the soil, across the soil. But instead of showing you data, I just thought I'd show you a picture. Because this picture really shows it quite well. You can see on the left side where they're using no tillage, um, there's no standing water. But on the right side of that fence, where they've been tilling, you can see all the ponded water. And so what is happening is there's a lot of different things going on. But one of the things is that when you have breakdown of organic matter, it helps bind the individual sand, silt, and clay particles together into what we call aggregates. And so when you get more aggregation, then you have more water pore space for pore space for water to infiltrate. You can, your roots can move more easily through that soil. And so can find that water, mine that water for, for nutrients, uh, mine the soil, I should say, for water and nutrients. But then also when you have that soil unprotected, like the soil on the right, now when the raindrops hit that soil, it breaks down those aggregates. So then they settle out and can create a crust. And I know this from my own experience when I used to try to farm. I was not a very good farmer, so I had to become a scientist instead. Uh, but what, when you can break down those aggregates and individual sand, silt, and clay particles settle out and form that crust. And so now the water cannot infiltrate as well. Now, of course, this is pretty level in this picture, and so you don't have to worry so much about the runoff, loss of nutrients to the nearby waterways. But this happens everywhere. It happens on the sloping hillsides also. So you can reduce, lose a lot of the nutrients of that way too. Uh, hopefully, I've given you, uh, given you enough of a convincing argument to let you know that a lot of these soil health promoting practices and systems are effective. It's in, backed up in the research literature. You can, you can see it on the ground. But our real issue is now how do we achieve scale? How do we achieve greater and greater scale of adoption of these types of practices? So at the Soil Health Institute, we, we start off with a very fundamental premise uh, that the most critical ingredient is our land manager, our, our farmers and ranchers, those that are managing in the U.S. Uh, some 50% of the landscape. These are the ones that are going to be adopting these practices. These are the ones that are going to be our climate champions. They're going to help us clean up our waterways. Uh, They're going to help us provide pollinator habitat, all these additional natural resource issues uh, that they're faced, and grow all this food for this burgeoning population. So that's where we start out. We start out with our goal of adoption and our comprehensive strategy, and then we start challenging ourselves, asking, okay, what type of information does a farmer need uh, when he or she decides whether or not to adopt these soil health promoting systems and practices? And so that takes us down the road of understanding the business case. Will these practices be beneficial profit in terms of profitability? Uh, will they increase or reduce uh, their economic risk? Uh, will it help them build drought resilience? What's the impact on land valuation? Um, can the ecosystem surface benefits be credited back to their farm? Things like carbon benefits and water quality benefits. But it's also true that it's really kind of unfair uh, of us 
uh, to ask them to improve something or manage something if we can't tell them how to measure it. And so that takes us down the road of identifying the most effective measures for soil health and uh, how you interpret those results. And then at the end of the day, so many of them also need some additional training just for how they modify their equipment, different seeding rates, what, what types of different species that they might use or different cultivars. And so we have an education program, hopefully if time allows, I'll delve into it a little bit and tell you a little bit more about that. But the bottom, the bottom line is, is it really, we do feel like it needs to be personalized uh, for their individual farm because all farms are different. Uh, different climatic zones and different production systems with which they are committed. Uh, we need to, to uh, work these into, into those systems that work for them. Of course, research and development backstops all of that. And, but then when we get that research and a development and then we even eventually get the <coughs> adoption levels, we feel like it's important that we don't stop there that we really quantify those impacts because when we quantify the impacts on productivity, that definitely ties back into the business case, but also quantifying those impacts on things like carbon sequestration, water quality, then that can help us inform our policies. It can also help us basically inform consumers of those benefits that we're having with our overall goal of increasing market demand. Uh, we want this to be kind of a self-sustaining system so we're not as dependent upon federal assistance uh, for adoption of these practices, but we want the free market to be driving the adoption so we get more and more benefits, more and more adoption. So I'll just very, very briefly touch on a couple of these that we we're doing because it was brought up in measurements. Well, how do we measure it? Uh, we also identified that this is an issue and it's an opportunity that we really need to address. A lot of different soils, different production systems, different climates, influence interpretation, different types of measurements. So we are conducting a project right now where we are evaluating 31 different soil health measurements at 124 long-term <coughs> research sites across North America, the US, Canada, and Mexico. So these are research sites where they have the appropriate experimental design, replications, et cetera, in place to allow us to come to the appropriate statistical conclusion of how effective each of these measurements is. Uh, and then in the business case, what we're doing there is we are conducting partial budgets on these 124 research sites, comparing the conventional system with the, along with the soil health system to determine uh, the effectiveness and, or the impact on profitability. But of course, we don't want to just believe research plots for that, so we are also interviewing 125 farmers, uh, many of them nearby those research sites to get that ground truth data, and we're integrating the results on that. Education and training, uh, we just launched this year a uh, education and training program for farmers. Uh, we started in three states this year, we're expanding to six states next year, uh, where we don't just parachute in and give a training and leave, but instead uh, we engage local farmers that are already successfully employing these practices, and we pay them a modest honorarium uh, to serve as mentors to the other farmers in, in their states and regions. Uh, in the research and development, one of the cool things we're working on right now, we believe it will be released around March of 2020, is a decision support tool so that farmers can select particular practices in order to achieve a targeted increase in water holding capacity in their soils, and therefore drought in their soils. And this is all focused, we know what, if we know where a given farmer is, then we know what soils they're on. And if we can get management practice information from them, we can help them build that drought resilience. We're quantifying the impacts of these uh, practices on productivity, uh, not just profitability, but also carbon sequestration, greenhouse gas emissions, and also trying to keep the policies informed. We just uh, released an evaluation of the 2018 Farm Bill, the impact of those policies on soil health. And then for the consumer education bit, we just uh, recently, well, about a year ago now, released what's called a living soil documentary. It is an hour long. Uh, but it's really good for like having a oh, staff meeting or some conservation districts are, are having meetings. And there's even a, a master's program at Stanford University showed it. Entire conferences are showing it, you know, for, for a lunch hour or something like that. Uh, and so it's really kind of cool. It's very farmer um, focused. It's very farmer friendly and interest uh, uh, for the kind of supporting them in, on this journey. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you.
Wayne, thank you very much. And we'll have